Mm-hmm. Right, guys, welcome to this tonight. Um, thanks for joining us or watching the recording, whichever you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, if you don't mind, if you're on the live call, if you don't mind just staying on mute. Uh, if you've got any questions to ask as we go, type them in the chat box. Um, I will hopefully preempt some of these and sort of like create a bit of conversation with Sam as we go. There'll be a bit of chance for some. Uh, we'll do it. We'll we'll answer some of the questions at the end. Um, so yeah, what what we what we wanted to bring to you tonight really was um, you know we've we've used the lab for I mean it's probably you know two and a bit years ago we started using it wasn't it Sam um, uh, Sam and Jules for those of you that aren't part of TTT or haven't met them yet are have been athletes of ours long term. Uh, they are also, um, as you can see on Sam's slide, Sam is senior lecturer in sports and exercise nutrition and Sam and Jules uh, are both doctors and they have all these fancy little uh, letters after their name uh, and um, they both work together at LMJU. They also form the pair that is Total Endurance Nutrition that we've been working with pretty closely. Um, and actually what we're going to talk about tonight, this 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 like joins the bridge perfectly between total try and total endurance nutrition, because as Sam will explain, what we see in the lab is not just um, what, um, how you can improve your training, but it's also, uh, you know, how you are from a nutritional standpoint. So there's, it opens lots of conversation. And then I think the key thing for tonight is, you know, we're, we're trying to get across several points about lab testing. Um, this is not just something for um for olympic level athletes um this is um something that absolutely everyone from people that are racing at lower level that need to make improvements or want to make improvements or want to understand how to make improvements uh, right up to those guys who uh, you know are racing at the right the real sharp end and then also and this is the key bit for me tonight how do we use the information gathered in the lab to enhance training and how do we at TTT actually use our growing knowledge of what we see from the lab um, ex- externally, uh, you know, to our athletes in their everyday training, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into like metrics versus RPE and stuff later on, I'm sure. But anyway, I'll hand over to Sam now and uh, Sam will sort of run you through what testing is all about and why we use it. And, and I'll probably come in with some real world type um, situations and stuff that people can relate to a little bit. Great. Cheers, Phil. Um, even everyone. Um, so, so yeah, so we're just going to have a, I guess, 30 minutes or so, maybe 40 minutes. We'll see how we get on of um, chat about physiological testing. So just starting out with what it's about, who's it for, what it's actually involves and then some of the metrics that we can get from it um, and some of the information that we can gather, which you can then use as athletes, your coaches can use to identify areas of weakness. And then we can, we can look to work on those. And, and now is like the perfect time really to, to start to do this. Everyone's had a little bit of a break uh, or is having a little bit of a break. And then you get back into training and those first, you know, after about a month of training or so is the perfect time to, to get like a, a winter reading, let's say, for some of these things. So um, what I'd say to to start with, so let's, you know, like definition of what it is really. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is look at key aspects of your physiology um, with the idea being to then inform both your training and nutrition and probably the combination of the two. And ultimately, we want to use that to improve performance. So fairly, fairly straightforward and as, as expected, I would think, for most of you. But Phil's kind of touched on this as well and who's it for and what I would, you know, emphasize again is this isn't just for elite athletes. So we think about maybe physiological testing. Um, we see it on, you you know, athletes doing it on YouTube, the likes of Lucy Charles, people like that. We know all about the Norwegians or we're starting to understand that, you know, the Norwegians, you know, put a lot of emphasis on this testing, constant testing in terms of understanding their athletes inside out. Um, but it doesn't mean it's just for those guys. And um, ultimately, I think 
you know, testing really and physiological testing is any for anyone. Um, you know, if you want to understand what is limiting your performance, um, then you need to understand, you know, what aspects of fitness you, you need to be focusing on. Another thing we'll probably come to again is you can use this to track progress over time. And this isn't the only type of way we can do that, of course, but it is, it is a good way depending on what the, you know, what an initial test um, might identify as areas of weakness. And I think a big one for all of us um, is that we want to get the most out of the time that we do put into training. And so, again, this is just one of those things where we can really start to identify you know, where those areas of weakness are and plan appropriately with the training, with your coaches or with the nutrition, depending on what the, uh, the target is. Okay, so I won't go into like heaps of detail and loads of physiology, but I will have just one slide in terms of some of the basics and understanding what is, uh, what are the main energy systems that we're using in the body when we actually, you know, exercise. And at the most basic level, you can split this into two parts. You've got an anaerobic component. Obviously that means no oxygen is required. It's typically called the glycolytic system. Um, and the other, and the other one is the aerobic energy system, which is obviously important, but both of these systems are key when we think about physiological testing and in the context of what we're going to talk about so that's kind of why i'm just introducing it at this point point. Um, and so the glycolytic system we can define that really as determining how much lactate you can actually produce because there's no oxygen present and as a result we produce lactate so this this tells us how much lactate we're actually able to produce as an athlete which isn't always a bad thing um and I'll flick through that. And then the aerobic system is determining how much lactate you can actually burn. So if we're producing it, how can we clear it? How fast can we clear it or deal with it? And so the glycolytic system, really, we've got, you know, carbohydrate is the key energy source there. And in particular, muscle glycogen, that's where most of our carbohydrate is stored in the body. We've also got some in the liver and then that, you know, enters the bloodstream and can be used as well. But ultimately, this system is about producing energy anaerobically. And as a byproduct of that, we produce lactate. The aerobic energy system, which is obviously important for us as endurance athletes, we can use both of those sources of carbohydrate again. Um, but we, in this case, we produce something called pyruvate. Doesn't matter too much. And ultimately, we, we, know, we generate some lactate, but we're able to clear that lactate. And of course, you know, an important point here, and we'll kind of come back to this a little bit more as well, is that we you know, really are able to tap into our fat stores. And some people are better able to do that than others. And, and again, that, that's linked to performance, as we'll, as we'll touch on. But that's the aerobic system. We can use both of those energy sources. So I suppose one of the questions that we often get is, can't you just do an FTP test? And I don't know, uh, I'm sure you can to a certain extent, um, but what I would say there's some additional information that we can get from physiological testing. So if we think about what an FTP test actually is and what it provides you, well, you smash yourself for 20 minutes and then look at the power, your average power, and you take 95% you know, of that to estimate what your FTP might be. And that, that's the most popular way, I suppose. And there's obviously uh, der uh, derivations of that as well. And of course, that does give you some information about the power, um, the heart rate you can sustain for maybe 20 minutes. You can, and then use your, uh, sorry, your coaches will use that to prescribe training zones through, um, through training peaks. And what it gives you really is an idea of what your lactate threshold is. So your anaerobic threshold, as it's also called. And not just at what power that is, but also at what heart rate that is. So there's some useful information there, of course, in terms of prescribing training based on this information. But one thing I would say is that not everyone, and, and FTP on, and uh, lactate threshold is is only really one component of the information that we can gather here. And if you take, for example, two, two athletes who are very you know, similar, one might have an FTP, call this at 300 watts, for example, and 
we can work out the contribution of that FTP or that power that you can generate for 20 minutes, what proportion comes from anaerobic energy and what comes from aerobic energy. Uh, and that might be very different between the two, two athletes that we've got as an example here. So you can see here that both athletes have, you know, the same FTP, but they generate that power through different energy sources and the, or different uh, proportion of these energy sources. And that has implications for how you might set training zones, of course, how that translates into a race, particularly when we start to think about 70.3 or Ironman racing, where we need to you know, be really tapping into that aerobic component. So it's just, a, just a, an example to illustrate that, yes, FTP is good, but we want some more, you know, we need some more information if possible. So what else do we get with physiological testing? And we've, we've said, you know, we think about the key determinants of triathlon performance. And first of all, yes, we get, you know, lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold, and that's brutal. We also get a number of other things. So and the, these all, you know, inform your triathlon performance essentially and, and can be tweaked and worked on. So an obvious one is VO2 max. So ultimately how fit you are. Um, we can, you know, we can get that from this information. Um, one of the other things that we can get is your aerobic threshold. And I'll come on to um, the difference between the anaerobic and the aerobic threshold um, in, in sh uh, shortly. Um, and the relationship between these two thresholds is really important as well. And, you know, how close they are or how far away they are, at what point, um, you know, what power they are, or heart rate they are of your maximum capacity. Uh, are really important so um, we can start to look at that in detail um, and then some nutrition related things we can understand how reliant you are on carbohydrates at, at different powers different heart rates and the same is also true for you know your ability to burn fat or fat burning capacity um, you know that's a really important determinant of particularly long distance racing so how well can you use your fat stores to to generate energy so a number of different um, outcomes really and variables that we can look at. Each of these, you know, on their own are important, but together really powerful in terms of tweaking and understanding you as an athlete and therefore where to, you know, where to go, where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are and how you can improve um, through the winter and into next year. Sam, like yeah. just jumping in on that last slide there, you know, like I think one of the things that, that links them all nicely together is when we talk about um, measuring improvement, you know, all of these things you would want to, you know, do a test, understand them, go away, train them, come back, see improvement in all of those areas. Ideally, you may target in on one or two things to start with to make specific gains, but all of these things, you know, in, in subsequent tests, you, you know, you want to be looking for a, improvement in the right direction i know you're going to go on about how the curve shifts and that kind of thing but um you know i think i think i see a lot of people think about going to the lab and they just get these numbers and that's the end of it like the, the, whereas actually it is about measuring change over time and making sure you're getting the adaptation to the training that you're, or the nutrition plan or whatever it is so. yeah no exactly um it's a, you know it's a start point i would say um for sure um okay so just to explain i suppose then we, we understand why we might be doing this test what information we're going to gather but what actually happens during the test and um there's various protocols let's say that you can use to um, establish these variables and measure these variables and um, the one we use at liverpool is fairly well tested um this is one that typically we use with a lot of um, more elite athletes as well that we have coming into the lab um, and ultimately it's in two parts. So the first part, we're really looking to identify where these thresholds are. So your anaerobic and aerobic threshold. Um, and then the second part is purely looking to and trying to understand what your VO2 max is. So that, that maximum aerobic capacity. So the first part of the test, and what I should say is this can be done either on a treadmill or uh, on, a, on a bike. Um, which we'll come on to a little bit uh, later on. Um, the protocol remains very similar between the two. 
in principle, you're starting off at a very low intensity. So this is an example on the bike. So maybe something about 50 or 80 watts, um, something like that. And then every four minutes, we're just increasing the workload by about 20 or 30 watts. And during each of those four minutes, we get you to breathe into um, this machine or this tubing here that leads to this machine. And this measures your oxygen uptake, um, CO2 production. Um, and then we can also calculate carbohydrate and fat oxidation rates from that as well. So we can understand your ability to burn carbohydrate and fat at these different um, workloads and heart rates. We also take a finger prick lactate, blood lactate reading at the end of each of these four minute stages as well. And so we can then generate a lactate curve and start to identify where your aerobic and your anaerobic thresholds lie. After, uh, or I should say the end of that, at the end of this first part of the test is when your lactate goes beyond four millimoles. Um, so four millimoles is this kind of um, theoretical threshold if we like beyond four millimoles your your lactate starts to exponentially increase so when your power is um or when you're cycling at power which creates lactate beyond four millimoles then that's when it just starts to go up and ultimately you can't you know maintain that power for much uh, too much longer so that's the the first part of the test so after that we'll just have 10 to 15 minutes recovery and then we start the second part of the test. And this time, our aim is to ultimately understand and measure your VO2 max in this case. And that's really the sole purpose of, of this part of the test. So it's a lot shorter, this part of the test. It starts off again, fairly low intensity. Again, on the bike here, 50 to 80 watts. We go up again in the same increments, 20 to 30. But this time, rather than every one minute, uh, sorry, every uh, rather than every four minutes, we're going up in one minute increments this time. So the idea here is we just get you to VO2 max fairly quickly, maybe within sort of 10 to 11 minutes, something like that. So it's not too painful, apart from the last few minutes uh, where we're where the work's getting pretty hard. Um, and that's really it. So altogether, that takes about an hour, an hour and 15, something like that to run through that. Um, when you're in the lab um, and you can see this is just an example of Chris doing this doing this test on the treadmill at, in the labs at Liverpool as well as uh, Phil on the bike in the previous slide and um, so there's a lot of information we can gather there from those from these uh, from these two parts to this test so let's think about you know the key metrics that we're actually getting from this test so VO2 max is the obvious one this is the one you know certainly when I was at university this was the one that everyone wanted a, a big VO2 max. And this was the one you were bragging about. And ultimately, you know, it, it gives you some information about the size of your engine to put it in layman's terms, really. And what we really mean by that is your maximum aerobic oxygen uptake capacity. Um, so what that really means is your VO2 max determines how much power ATP is that you know what we're trying to generate into energy terms. How much power can you produce with aerobic uh, metabolism, essentially? And important thing here, and the principle here is that your oxygen consumption and uptake is directly proportional to the aerobic energy production. So those with a poorer oxygen consumption um, have a have a low aerobic energy production, and vice versa. Uh, and I always think it's interesting to, um, to look at some of the uh, other sports just very briefly, um, because, you know, triathletes have fairly good VO2 maxes in general, certainly at the elite level, but, you know, certainly not compared to um, some of the other sports. For example, I always like to look at cross-country skiing here for both men and for women. The VO2 max is absolutely ridiculous, really. You get into the 80s and the 90s. Um, I would say most people that come, like most high-level triathletes, runners, cyclists that we've had in the lab, maybe somewhere between 65 and, and 70. Um, so yeah, some of the some of the VO2 maxes in the cross-country skiers are absolutely 
bonkers, but uh, something to aim for when you come in anyway, let's say. Um, okay, so the other, and I suppose the, the more interesting ones, let's say, the, the ones that we're not bragging about necessarily, um, unless you're very keen, um, are the lactate thresholds. And this is the, the type of curve that we generate from the um, from both parts of the test. So on the bottom of this graph, we've got um, workload, power, and then on the right, uh, on the right, uh, left-hand side, should I say, we've got the lactate concentrations in the blood. And you can see that these are the points at which they were taken, these incremental powers. And we start, you know, starts off fairly low, maybe about one millimole, we get some increases, and then we start to get a small increase, and then it starts to rise. We go beyond four after about 320 watts in this individual. And then we also take a lactate reading right at the very end of the VO2 max part of the test um, just to complete this curve. But this is, you know, like a typical curve that we might generate um, in the lab. And, and from this, we can identify two things. So as I've you know, spoken about already, there are actually two lactate thresholds that we can identify. The first one is, you know, the one that most people will talk about, the one that corresponds to maybe FTP, um, your LT2, lactate threshold 2, your anaerobic threshold. And as I said, this is the point at which this lactate accumulates exponentially or after this point. Um, so, you know, you can see, you can get the power or you can get the heart rate at which this uh, lactate threshold corresponds to. So that's useful information. The other one we can gather in, uh, and, and, and measure is your LT1 or your aerobic threshold. And from a definition perspective, this is essentially an increase of one millimole uh, in your lactate concentrations above typically baseline or your lowest lactate value, depending on um, what, the, uh, what the curve looks like. But really this is, you know, this is important because it's indicative of your aerobic base. So, for example, those who train, you know, with massive volume, maybe, you know, some of the elites, 25, 30 hours a week, their aerobic base is going to be very good and their LT1 um, is going to be, uh, you know, the power they're able to push at their LT1 will be fairly high. You know, LT1 is really important when we think about the power, um, the heart rate that we might want to train in order to improve our performance, particularly at Ironman, but also at 70.3 distance. Uh, and even beyond Ironman, I suppose, for some, some people as well. So LT1 is really important in, in terms of, um, you know, that aerobic ability that you're going to need to, to you know, to be a, um, to perform well as an endurance athlete. Sam, just like, keep like go like swinging this into a bit of perspective on like how you know people that we coach and when we're talking about doing aerobic endurance work easy runs steady runs zone two this lt1 really is um uh you know defines the upper limit really for your endurance work um you know and it's we we train anything below lt1 is classed as your aerobic base work, if you like. Some of it might be well below LT1. You might push right up to LT1. You even train on LT1 to develop it. You can manipulate the zone. Um, but I think if you look at the two arrows uh, pointing down at the bottom of the graph and you consider the first arrow to be um, the top of zone one, if we're talking about a three-zone training model, that is the top of zone one. The distance between the two arrows is zone two and everything after the right hand arrow is zone three. And we generally, you know, use a principle of a lot of training is done in zone one and from the start of zone three or maybe just below it upwards polarized training approach. Of course, there are, you know, we won't go into the details of why you do train in that zone two area sometimes, race specificity, et cetera. But um, that's why knowing both those numbers is so key. Um, someone's just asked a question a minute ago, which they were asking about, you mentioned um, 
uh, typical FTP testing. And obviously with TTT, we generally use critical power testing or even uh, power duration curves, which is testing, you know, uh, at least two points, like three minutes and 20 minutes or three minutes and 12 or several points within that. Um, and looking at the relationship between aerobic and anaerobic thresholds there, that doesn't really give you this information. That will give you the relationship between, you know, like, for example, whether you are someone with a very strong anaerobic system or a very weak anaerobic system, and we can manipulate training to, to help you be in the right place for your chosen discipline. These figures for me are just as important if not more to know where's the top of zone one you know where's the top of the easy stuff and then where does the hard stuff start from um you know to try and have a really clear view on on your numbers so i'd say you know this is something that's very difficult to get outside of the lab so just thought I'd jump in there mate yeah um and I suppose, yeah, just to just to go back to the um, repeat testing idea, you know, if we take on the correct training, um, then ultimately what we see when you come back for another test is we want to see a rightward shift in this curve. So this is the first curve we had up on the, the last slide. Um, and then this, the right training and the new, right nutrition in combination shift this curve to the right. So ultimately at the same uh, or LT2, we're now pushing more power for a similar heart rate. And the same is true for LT1 as well. Um, did you did you have did you have uh, Jan in the lab to get these numbers, mate? No, that was me. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wish. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, someone like Jan. Um, yeah. So so you know, ultimately, that's what we're trying to achieve when we look at this repeat testing because. Ultimately, LT2, if we can sustain this higher power, um, then brilliant. Obviously, it's still fairly, car well, highly carbohydrate dependent. Um, so you can only spend a limited amount of time at this intensity. With LT1, then, then great, because if we, you, if we can push a higher power for the same um, mix of carbohydrates and fats that we're burning in the body, then, then brilliant. We're, or, or maybe we can push a slightly lower power and burn more fat for example, which we'll, we'll kind of come on to uh, in a sec. So yeah, substrate utilization or fat and carbohydrate oxidation, let's say, and, and burning. So this is another important thing that we, uh, yeah, we, we want to develop and we can understand from this type of testing. And I don't think you can really, well, you certainly can't do this accurately outside of the lab. Um, so again, a little bit of physiology, as I said, right at the start, um, you know, we store most of the carbohydrate in our body and muscle, um, which is really important. We also have a um, small store, but equally uh, an important store in the liver as well. And so, you know, when we carb load, we want to maximize these, these values, obviously. Um, but the key point is they're fairly limited, especially when you compare that to how much fat, you know, irrespective of who we are, we have in the body, you know, somewhere, if you take the average person, somewhere between maybe five and 15 kilos of fat, that's equivalent to about 80,000 to 140,000 calories worth of energy. So you can see that this is a massive store of energy. And ultimately we want to be able to use that store where we're, you know, where possible and spare our carbohydrate stores, at, you know, at the most basic level. So we want to teach our body and understand how our body uses fat, whether it's efficient at it or not. Um, yeah, so the other point to, to make here is there's a bit of research, won't go into details, but fat oxidation is absolutely um, one of the key indicators of performance at both 70.3 and also in Ironman athletes as well, and in particular Ironman athletes. So um there's been a uh, few sort of papers written about this in the last few years, actually, from a research perspective. But um, I always like to, to take this information, and, and this is from a, another paper. I can't take credit for this, but um, they did some modeling in this paper based on people who they describe as having a good fat burning ability and a bad fat burning ability. Um, and so 
you know, at uh, or to try and ride a five hour bike leg in an Ironman, maybe 225 watts, something like that, you're going to have to average, depending on the course, of course. Then people who are good at burning fat, and don't worry too much about the numbers here, but 1.1 grams per minute of fat basically is being used as, as fuel in this case. You know, um, if that's the bur fat burning rate during this five hour bike leg, then they, you know, the athlete is going to use approximately 339 grams of carbohydrate. Take someone with a poorer ability to burn fat and tap into those fat stores. You can see quite clearly you start to, you know, maybe double or even more than double your carbohydrate requirements to maintain that same power. So this just illustrates again, how important it is to burn the fat. Uh, and being able to tap into those fat stores. I mean, you can you can make some estimates here, um, of course, in terms of, well, how many carbs do I need to eat to offset this? And, you know, 339 grams is like 68 grams per hour. That's fairly reasonable for most people. Um, if you're going to try and do, or if you've got a poor ability to burn fat and you want to ride at this power, then you're going to have to somehow find a way of consuming 154 grams per hour uh, of carbs. And yeah, okay, these numbers are a bit playful in some ways, but it just illustrates the point that being able to burn fat that you've got stored in your body is absolutely critical when it comes to performance at uh, endurance, uh, you know, endurance sport. Um, so what we can do is understand your ability to actually tap into those fat stores how carbohydrate reliant you are during uh, or different powers, different heart rates during this test as well. So um, one of the things we, uh, you know, a key measure, I suppose, is this ability to burn fat and we term it maximum fat oxidation and also identify where your maximum fat oxidation rates actually are. So again, this is um, the curve that we kind of generate from this information and for this person, their fat oxidation uh, is maximal at about 230 watts, something like that. Sometimes the curve looks a little bit more like this, depending on the person. Sometimes, you know, this might be the highest point and therefore the, the ability to burn fat would be fairly low. Um, so we can start to, you know, start to understand how well you tap into those fat stores um, in this way. And... I guess to put that into a bit of context as well is um, as Phil said, right at the start, we've been doing this for like, well, <laughs> probably two and a half years or so now take out COVID. We probably, you know, did a year's worth of data collection and um, we've got a good idea of how well TTT athletes, you know, in that period were, could burn fat. And in this case on the um, left-hand side of this graph, we've got maximal fat oxidation rates for both people who came in and did a cycling test and then also people who did a running test. And this was the spread of information. And I've put this dotted line, if you like, on again, just as a, it's a bit arbitrary, 0 0.8, but based on a lot of research, if you've got a maximum uh, fat burning ability over 0 0.8 grams per minute, then that's considered pretty good. Below that, then there's work, you know, there's work to do essentially. So you can see we've got quite a spread here all the way from about 0 0.2 all the way up to nearly one for in cycling. Um, so I think, you know, that's interesting to a certain extent, but to take that to another level, that information, I always like to think about that in terms of the power that you might ride at uh, during an Ironman, for example. And some, you know, if you're a fairly good athlete, then you should be able to ride um the Ironman bike leg at LT1 essentially. Um, and so we can look at actually at LT1, rather than just understanding what your maximum fat oxidation rate is, what is your fat oxidation rate at LT1? And that's what I've got on this graph here. So this is a bit more like how much fat am I going to burn when I'm trying to perform an Ironman bike leg for however many hours at this power, at this intensity. And when you do that, this is the same people. It shifts it, a lot, you know, quite quite a way down. 
So you can really start to see here, there's some you know, key improvements that we can make from both a training and a nutrition perspective to improve that ability to burn fat through specific um, training sessions combined with specific nutrition um, around those sessions as well. Um, and also we can start to use this um, tentatively as well, I would say, to inform your requirement for carbohydrate during during the this type of, you know endurance events as well and, and what you might be able to tolerate or sorry what you might be able what you might require um in terms of fueling your performance sam so just wh well, while you're on that there you know like we obviously mentioned 70.3 and ironman athletes quite a bit there and the relation and obviously you know very very important the longer it gets but i think like a common you know we always talk about um you know what distances people race and one thing we certainly see certainly at age group race it is the guys who are pretty handy at 70.3 and ironman are also pretty good over the shorter distance as well certainly in their i don't know in their slightly younger years um but um th this idea we discussed it the other night with the coaches didn't we you know like your ability to use fat as a fuel like being like metabolically flexible nearly, you know, it, it's good for overall health as well. And like I've got like, you know, strong belief that a health, you know, a healthy person is a great foundation to make a good athlete. And uh, if your fat burning is very poor, you know, it doesn't really matter if you sprint distance, Olympic distance or 5k runner, you know, you, to some degree, we want a certain level of good fat oxidative, you know, Mo Farah might not compete over 10 hours, but he's probably a very healthy individual and probably does burn fat quite well. So, um, you know, that's something that um, when we then think about how does everybody do that, you know, obviously we discussed the other night, didn't we? Like training volume is certainly key, um, but it can also be manipulated with diet, you know, and that's stuff people can talk to you guys about. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and even like, using periodization within your diet and how you fuel certain sessions you know it's it, there's a it's a complex picture but there's there's a way for nearly everyone to improve their current situation here isn't there so yeah no exactly and uh, yeah from a yeah if we would take out performance and the health you know uh, aspect is really important too and i suppose you know that's what me and joel spend um a lot of time actually doing at work as well is we work with more unhealthy populations and we're really interested in how we can improve that switch between the fuels um, and that that's you know critical for health but it's also critical perform for performance as well um, so irrespective of whether you're talking about athletes or you know more unhealthy people and um, yeah. something that you know we really want to work on um, the last thing I'll say about the, the substrate use aspect here is that, again, if we do the right training, we do the right nutrition, then we can start to shift. Um, well, there's a few things that we might do. We might shift to the point at which we see maximum fat oxidation occurring. So it might occur at a slightly higher power, or we might see that that maximum fat oxidation rate occurs at the same power, but the overall uh, you know, absolute uh, value that we achieve is is a lot higher. So there's very you know various things that we can try and address uh, in terms of that ability to burn fat. And I suppose I've focused a lot on fat here, just because I know it's important for endurance performance. But the flip is that uh, the flip side of that is the carbohydrate, and we can you know we can get the same information, understand that reliance on carbohydrate at these different powers, different heart rates relative to your LT1 and LT2 uh, as well with uh, with this testing. You could really dial in like, um, you know, race nutrition plans pretty accurately from this information, can't you as well? Or certainly get right within the ballpark of it. So. Yeah, yeah, it gives, a, it gives a really good start point. And also, you know, for example, if you're, you know, maybe you're racing a 70.3 and your ability to burn fat is, is it like let's say not poor but fairly average then that suggests that you're going to have to you know rely uh, quite a lot on carbohydrates so that you know informs how you're going to load with carbohydrates in the day or days leading up to the event but also how we then fuel that and what 
what our expectations can be in terms of the power that you might be able to uh, you know uh, maintain or speed you might be able to maintain when you're running um based on these values as well so it, yeah it's, it gives us a really good idea um well, great start. i'm just gonna like there's a slight tangent i'm gonna go on here which is to do with yeah. the time of year we're in and people have probably heard me harp on already about you know off season post season pre season whatever this period is we're all in how you know this is actually a really pivotal part of the year it is lower stress lower volume time to have a few beers at the weekend with your mates that's all great but there's a lot of really good things you can do at this point of the year because i actually also go if you're racing in march next year that's 17 weeks to the middle of march you know it's not that long to get on top of race nutrition where to make improvements um uh you know i see people going in the flume with hamo that's the right time of year to start that process people coming in for bike fits now that's great we're doing a training camp in lanzarote next week those guys will pick up loads of great ideas going into the winter and this this exact thing we're talking about here is something to get your head around this side of christmas really get retesting in february march you know if it, it all depends on where your race schedule sits but you can see that there's loads of ways to to use a lot of what we do and what we're talking about tonight to to really enhance next season but it's it's nearly got to happen now you know february march it's too late we're already there and um you know if you want to change how you burn fat for example that ain't happening overnight is it so uh uh you know it needs a longer a longer lens on it so we were talking about i was talking to you the other night wasn't i about you know uh, the guys you work with nutritionally and I think some people see you know the end of season and then they sort of go oh, I'm going to eat what I want for a little while I'll uh, you know I'll come back you know let's get through Christmas and I'll be back um, and actually maybe you know if you if you're trying to improve areas like this that that's maybe a little bit late you know it, it's um, it might be about shifting the time of year you focus on certain things you know even i would certainly pay much more attention to this fat burning over the winter period once you're into race season and you're in race specificity you already want to know what your nutrition plan is to be practicing it for gut tolerance and just be thinking ahead i suppose is what i'm i'm getting at here yeah i totally agree phil it's it, well when we were chatting the other night about my plan <laughs> and we you know we're blocking it out and you go well actually yeah, it's going to come around pretty quick, isn't it? And this is exactly, you know, the same thing. You've got to get started now with these things, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, yeah, so I think that was actually uh, that was actually me. So just to summarise, these are the key kind of things that we can measure with the uh, physiological testing, really, in the lab. Um, and I think, Phil, you're, you're going to try and head off some questions for you just now. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... Um... One just come in here, which, you know, I'll throw my view on it. You can give the, the, the actual answer, uh, you know, with a bit more uh, qualifications behind you on this subject. But someone asking, um, would you recommend a keto diet to kickstart the fat burning process? Um, I suppose like my um, my view from a coaching point of view here is, you know, and we're all like this, me included, us as triathletes, it's all or nothing, isn't it? If we're going to do something, it's got to be the most extreme way to start burning fat. So would I recommend diving into a keto diet? No, probably not. Um, I'd probably recommend speaking to someone who knows what they're doing, but I'll hand you over to one of those people. Sam, what's your view of that? Um, yeah, keto diet. It depends, I suppose, if you've any experience with a keto diet to start with. That's a big thing. One of the things we know that a keto diet does especially over a long period of time is yes, it will improve your ability to burn fat, but it also reduces your high end uh, performance as well. Um, so, and, you know, when you're starting to do some of the high intensity work that is prescribed by the coaches, it becomes quite difficult to hit the high numbers on a keto diet. If you truly subscribe to a keto diet. Um, so my personal view is that you can take a bit more of a measured approach to it and you can maybe restrict or train with lower carbohydrate availability around certain sessions. And that means that you're getting some of the um, 
adaptation in terms of fat burning ability to those appropriate sessions. But the other sessions, the harder stuff, um, you fuel that well, you perform well, you push your, you push your, you know, your high end work up um, and maintain performance and uh, that intensity really. So I, th I think it's quite, well, yeah, that, that's my personal opinion anyway. I, I'm much more of a believer in periodizing carbohydrates and fats around the training, which is a little bit more complex, but you do get, you know, the benefits of improving your ability to burn fat, but also maintaining that high end work as well, which, you know, based on the, and Phil will probably um, back me up on this, based on the TTT way of thinking, that polarized approach, Phil talks about training, you know, below LT1 or maybe at or above LT2, fueling those is very different. And you can achieve that with periodized carbohydrate intake. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen, you know, I, well, I, I would generally say uh, most solid thinking at the moment is that this periodized approach is the optimal way. Uh, I think as well, when you, I've seen the way you guys work with people and there's other people out there, um, you know, there's actually a good cookbook I use all the time from the, uh, Alan Merkis and the performance chef. He's a cycling chef. Uh, very similar idea of traffic lighting the days um, and what to eat. And it's a little bit complex to start with, but I think it, you just, as with everything, you become educated and you get a, then a, a, an intrinsic feeling for what to eat on certain days, knowing what's coming up the next day and it becomes simpler. So I wouldn't get too scared off of thinking about of changing your diet every 24 hours around your training. It, it nearly becomes a natural thought process. You end up knowing recipes and all that kind of thing. So my uh, personal, yeah, just to build on that, I think having had a little bit of an attempt at a keto diet as well, um, I think it's actually easier to periodize your carbs than it is to, to subscribe to a keto diet. That's just my personal opinion, again, based on my experiences in terms of yeah. planning what you're going to eat really. And, and, and uh, yeah, that's, that's just the way I see it anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, is there anything else I've just written down? I think I've covered all those points there. There's a message here about body composition. Um, uh, percentage of body. For, well, one thing that can be done at the lab is uh, to get a, a feel for a, uh, your body composition and actually we talk about uh vo2 vo2 max as well which is actually impacted by by your weight as well isn't it so you know to lose weight um you know can see vo2 max go up so that's again bringing diet into performance we all you know generally um uh you know know that um you know carrying carrying our christmas pounds probably isn't putting us at opt optimal performance um i'm just trying to understand this question briefly sorry um i'll say yeah so measuring body composition is part of the te this testing as well um because we're interested in you know like yeah vo2 max is a great example that we want to you know you get the number relative to body weight but really it's relative to the amount of muscle you have which is important um and then also you know if you're looking to you know improve your performance and improving your body composition is also an important component of that doesn't that doesn't mean losing weight all the time it means improving your body composition of course weight loss can be a part of that but um how we do that nutritionally is is quite you know uh, quite important as well sam yeah um, hello hamo hamo here you know i like to ask a question hello um Okay, I, I, and this is probably on the back of athletes on conversations I've had probably uh, with, that we've all had probably over the years is can, and you talked about body composition, is there a balance point between body composition and ability over longer distance racing? So, so for example, you know, people are obsessed with body fat percentage. Is there a point where body fat percentage becomes a detrimental number when it's too low 
in order to if you are if you are there for a good fat burner so we improve our fat burning but the problem is is we have a very lean body mass and therefore we are restricting our ability to burn fat uh, so it's a loaded question but i think it would be good to for you to answer that um you would do well to become uh, you know you'd have to be almost anorexic before you became limited by your fat stores or you know even someone who's very lean still has a lot of fat calories in their body but i do agree um i think it's dangerous to focus on becoming very lean um it yes it will improve performance no doubt because you look at you know the likes of lionel sanders even you know jan fredino people like that they're all very lean of course but there's a health aspect to it as well um which i firmly believe is important because especially during the winter when you know things like colds are knocking around um having a little bit more fat isn't actually a bad thing and can be a bit protective in many ways when it comes to them racing again just you know i, I think it's dangerous to, to to just focus on becoming super super lean and you have to be very careful about how you go about that because one of the things that you will undoubtedly do if you just focused on leanness is as a result of that you have to cut calories quite extreme and you also are therefore going to lose some of your muscle mass as well as fat. You can't, you know, you can't, it's very tricky to say, I only, well, it's impossible to say, I only want to lose fat. And therefore you're going to impact your, you know, you know, we're relying on muscle to generate power speed when we're, you know, running or cycling. So losing that muscle um, is going to be of detriment to your performance. So I think, yeah, it's, it's striking a balance which is which you've got to be careful about and i also think you've got to be careful at what periods in the year you actually try and do that as well so winter's a great time to start to think about well, okay so if i'm carrying a little bit more weight than i want to then we can start to lose that might be that might be the focus and then as you come towards race season then we can start to think about how you might become a little bit leaner but it's not you know, becoming super lean isn't the isn't the aim really. I think I think that idea, Sam, of like um, a fluctuating weight over the year. You know, in if you're racing northern hemisphere races and there's a period of the year where you're not, you know, you had dinner at mine the other night, didn't you? Like we both went back for seconds at dessert. You know, no problem. It wasn't even a hesitation. That you just you have that part of the year where, in fact, I was telling you what I'd eaten the day before as well. It was just, if I hammer, I sent you photos of it. It was a disgrace. But, you know, think about what time of year it is. And, uh, you know, I, I think a bit of fluctuation for all the reasons Sam said, but there's another reason I see athletes. They, It's like those guys who can't back off training all year round. They never really pick up performance in the summer because they didn't let it go enough in the winter. And, and it's the same with your weight. If you are uh, not one of these natural stick insects, I, per, you know, which I'm not, uh, I tend to personally let myself mentally chill out about what I eat a little bit more in the winter. And, and as we head to race season, I can then have the mental capacity to just be a little bit stricter on myself to get myself to a healthy race weight. Um, and I think people like should periodize the year a little bit like that. And uh, I think that that long term is, is a lot easier to do for most. So, would... and obviously just one other point here, we're, we're talking about fat as in, body fat that makes you heavier versus our ability to burn fat and i think these two things definitely i think in a way hamo that was probably like one of the things you were asking is these are two different things aren't they they're yeah they're, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. even the leanest person will have plenty of fat to burn for a whole iron man you ain't running out of the stuff no chance so um it's our you know our ability to like use it as as fuel versus race weight these are two very different things so you could allow yourself to carry more weight in the winter while also doing the right training to learn to utilize your fat stores better you might not drop weight specifically now um but it's you, you're actually training two they're two totally different topics aren't they 
Yeah, no, exactly. I also think uh, we're getting a bit, little bit off tangent, but it also depends on your starting point as well. Um, <laughs> you know, for example, Phil, you've got you know pretty good diet, so it's it's a good foundation to then work from. But that you know that's another that's probably yeah. another conversation to have at, at some point. Yeah, I'm just going to um, Sam. If you stop sharing your screen for oh, me yeah. a sec, I will share mine. Um, Yeah. Just, oh, go ahead. Um, Sam, uh, we, you, uh, and I suppose it's a, it's a curiosity probably more than a related to fat burning is we talk about LT1 always being that tipping point where we start to produce lactic and then LT2 being four millimoles. Can you, or and this, I don't know why I'm asking this question, but I just think it's interesting is can you get someone that can tolerate way more lactic in their blood than somebody else but but lt2 is a scientific decided lt2 does that make sense so are you asking if it's genetic essentially K kind of so so if you if you were to for example if you take a track cyclist they are conditioning themselves to basically buffer and flush lactate at very very high intensities because that's what they need so does it mean that their lt2 is still the same but their tolerance of lactic has improved or is their lt2 massively higher because of their ability to tolerate lactic does that make sense uh i think so yeah so i'd say the latter their lt2 will be pretty high i would think but yeah, it's just it's just that ability to tolerate it. It just depends how long you need to tolerate it for, as well, of course. L um, LT two yeah. can be. I mean, I know we use four millimoles, but it can vary slightly from there, actually, can't it? And long distance yeah. endurance athletes can actually have lower, um, as well as slightly higher. You know, it, you know, I've seen people that you know some of the Norwegian guys like reckon it's like three and a half for them or whatever. But but. Um, I think really the other way to think of LT2, it's the point at which lactate um, accumulates exponentially. And, and, and if you, if you think of it from that, and that normally happens as you pass four millimoles, doesn't it? And that, that therefore, if, if yes, if a track cyclist has conditioned themselves there and, or genetically their LT2 occurs at six millimoles, well, it's still after L, their LT2, it, it's, it accumulates exponentially. That's, that, that, that was the question is, is the, is the date is the testing once you once you once you find four millimoles of lactic in the blood that's their lt2 or is it is there other factors that determine what that person's lt2 is that was the question and then my follow-on question to that was what's the view therefore of lactate buffering whether it's x endurance by carb etc well, yeah, you can start to you can start to do that depending on the types of sessions and what you want to achieve from those sessions. Um, they are well. I don't know specifically about the X endurance lactate buffer um, too much. I'm not. I'm not sure you'd take it on a daily basis. Uh, this, but again, it's without any supplement. Really, you want to periodize when you use it, and you want a reason to use it around certain sessions and that will be dictated on how you know maybe need to load with sodium bicarb for example um so it becomes yeah i think there's that's a that's a that's a massive conversation to have depending on what, what you want to achieve really i think what one thing it does make me eager is is actually being well hydrated for your harder sessions is actually quite key isn't it because blood lactate is the millimoles of lactate per liter of blood. And if you're dehydrated, you will actually have less blood volume in your body. Therefore lactate concentration hits threshold earlier. So, you know, little, little tip for you all. If you, if you go in the lab, drink loads the day before you want to be well hydrated going in. So, uh, um, look, I'm just going to spin into these. Uh, this is just two very quick slides to round it up. Basically. Um, uh if i can make my computer work apologies um 
yeah, just very quickly, how does this all relate to like our core values at TTT? So getting people into the lab uh, or going through that kind of a process enhances the education of athletes. And, you know, one of our core values is the education of athletes on their journey. Um, you know, the athletes in the middle, the coach is part of the circle, you know, Sam and Jules might form another part of it. Your bike fitter, the guys you go to races with, the other athletes you mix with, the community, it's all, you know, it all adds to that. And this, this is a something that will help you understand your own body, um, how you're going to improve and make you understand your training. You know, you can hear like me, um, Hamo and Sam talking here with understanding of what's happening and and i think that's where really we want everyone to get to this point so that you understand how i sent an email to my athletes to some of my athletes this morning about a session i'd done i'd actually taken lactate this morning while doing it and i whether i act or not act on the information you know i i can pass that information to them for their thought process in their session how it should feel etc which brings me on to point two which is you know, this idea of we use power, we use pace, we use heart rate, uh, we use RPE, rate of perceived exertion, and actually understanding where your lactate thresholds sit uh, or how you're burning fat are other pieces of data that, that help in this puzzle. You know, if your fat max is quite low, that we might determine that actually the power you should do your endurance rides at is to improve fat max. It's not necessarily that could rather than relating it to a percentage of threshold or something like that. It's all adding to the information we've got. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've put, uh, you know, this evolve or die philosophy. I think we, you know, we are as a, as a group of coaches, uh, I hope it comes across. We are always looking at the, the you know, what's next for athletes. Um, you know, how do you keep moving them on? Um, and this could be like the next step in your evolution is to get testing or at least to start understanding this um, and bringing it into your training. So you can make on the fly decisions as to how hard you should be going. Um, you know, and I'm not just talking about the hard sessions, but the easy stuff as well. Uh, and what you're getting out of every session. And then the last point, yeah, just, you know, this is for everyone, you know, every ability level, you know, even I even wonder whether from an education standpoint, the newer to the sport you are, the more you stand to gain here. So, um, yeah. Um, and then just in summary, um, yeah, this is at Liverpool, John Moores, as Sam's touched on. Uh, there are plenty of other locations around the country. You can get testing. Um, if you're going to get tested in another location, it's worth speaking to your coach or one of us guys. Um, Liverpool does use like gold standard of lab equipment, and that does matter, especially on things like the substrate use, um, you know, the reliability of the data. Testing, you know, give yourself an hour and a half window. Um, if you want to do two tests, three to four months seems like a sensible thing for me. It keeps keeps it cost effective, gives you time to adapt, um, you know, and uh, and anyone that wants to do that, we'd probably like preempt, uh, you know, a second test and a date. Test and analysis, you know, um, we've done a lot of work with the coaches lately on, you know, full, full understanding of all this so that you can have great conversations with your coach on this subject any external athletes can, you know, we will, we'll just deal with one of us here. Obviously the guys at Sam and Jules, you know, you can touch base with them from a, you know, anything from a substrate use point of view. They're the real experts there. Um, it's on the website. If anyone wants to book in, anyone wants to ask any questions, reach out to your coach, reach out to me, reach out to Sam and Jules. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah. Even if you've got questions, this is, this is all about like offering a service that some will use and some won't, but ultimately we're trying to further educate everyone involved here. So, Phil, I've just had two points to, you know, you said about two tests, three to four months apart there, which is probably about right. What I'd say is people coming back from winter break, let's say, uh, start, you probably want a month or would you agree? Probably a month or so of training before you get tested first to get your baseline you don't want to come straight off your window into yeah. a test and another yeah i agree and another really important thing here is like when you're going for these tests you know and i've done these tests with you when i've been a bit fatigued 
it would, you know, we've done them like just let's get in and let's see what the lab setup is. I'll do a test while I'm there. You need to be fresh for these. You know, this is like, um, you know, you want the data to be accurate. You certainly need several easy days leading into it, in my opinion. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's not the kind of thing you want to get wrong. You want the data to be accurate. So uh, yeah. Um, the other, the only, the last point I'd say is you don't want you don't if you were going to do a repeat test or even you know, just the first test, you wouldn't want to do that close to a race either. You know, just to see where you are. There's absolutely no point in doing that. I, yeah. I don't know what you probably suggest, Phil. Maybe five or six weeks out from a race, maybe. Yeah, nearly a bit of time to even react to what you're seeing. You know, if someone's like seeing LT2 a bit low or something, the racing Olympic distance, you know, you've got a bit of time to do some work in the next block. And yeah, timing's key. But again, you know, um, it, you know, think about it now, uh, you know, and anyone that wants to do these, and um, you know, it be January, February onwards, just reach out now so that, you know, slots are limited, Sam and Jules aren't aren't just at the university to do total try trainings tests so uh they have uh, lots of other things to do so the slots are relatively limited uh you know to two or three a week on average isn't it so uh yeah good look i hope everyone found it interesting um and uh anyone that's missed it will pop it up on the um pop it up on youtube for everyone to watch i'll do that now for you so sam uh, I know, Jules, you've not uh, you've sat in the background here, but uh, I know, you know, you have a lot to do with the prep of these things. Thanks very much. And uh, yes, yeah, Sam, cheers for that as well. Right. And uh, Hamo for your input. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Always forget to stop recording.